The Liger is probably the most popular hybrid animal and an incredibly large cat. You won't see them in the wild. People most deliberately breed them. Lions and tigers don't even inhabit the same areas. So, a liger is a mix of a male lion and a female tiger, and they can grow to be very big in a pretty short period of time. They're actually the biggest cats in the world. Hercules, the largest recorded liger, is a real example of that. 922 pounds and 10.8 feet long. Imagine taking him for a walk. Ligers are mostly way bigger than either of their parents. In most cases, they behave and look more like lions than tigers. But they have some tiger traits too. For example, striped backs. And they're crazy about swimming. The Tigan. Nobody could fault you for thinking the Tigan and Liger are basically the same animal. I mean, they're both a combination of tigers and lions. But a Tigan comes from a crossbreeding of a male tiger and a female lion. They're usually smaller than their parents, and definitely much smaller than their giant, could you call them siblings? In most cases, they inherit charming looks from their tiger fathers, but they get some interesting traits from their mother's side too. For example, love for socialization and the ability to roar. Hands down, one of the rarest hybrid animals in the world are wolfins. These fellas are a mashup of a female bottlenose dolphin and a male false killer whale. Its name might make you think differently, but a false killer whale belongs to the dolphin family. They're not even related to killer whales. Wolfins are such an interesting 50-50 mix and balance of their parents. They have dark gray skin, the perfect blend of a black false killer whale and light gray dolphin skin. Dolphins have anywhere between 80 and 100 teeth. False killer whales have 44. And their hybrid young is halfway, with 66 teeth in total. What would it look like if algae and a slug paired? No need to imagine. You have a green sea slug to check the result. It lives in salt marshes in Canada and New England. And it's possibly the weirdest hybrid creature you'll see in this video, and in general. Part plant, part animal. So, some slugs seem to have been very sneaky while stealing the genes from innocent algae that they have eaten to enable them to look like this. Since they're partially a plant, they can produce the plant pigment called chlorophyll. That means these unusual slugs can even photosynthesize. That's the process plants use to turn sunlight into energy. So they produce their own molecules that contain energy without having to eat anything at all. When scientists first discovered it, a green sea slug was the first case of a multicellular animal that's able to produce chlorophyll. What do you get when you mix a male leopard and a female lion? You get an interesting hybrid called a lepin. These animals grow to be almost as big as lions, but they still have shorter legs, similar to their father leopard. They inherit some of his other traits too, like a love for climbing and swimming. You can have a union with a male lion and a female leopard too, and the result is called a leopard. Male lions are usually around 10 feet long and weigh about 500 pounds. The female leopard is way smaller, only 5 feet long with a weight of about 80 pounds. The difference in size here is too big, so this pairing really doesn't happen that often. Okay, how about a buffalo and a cow? When you were little, maybe you thought that they could be a good match, but in reality, the combination creates an unusual hybrid animal called a beefalo. Not many types of hybrid animals can reproduce on their own, but a beefalo can do it. When a grizzly and a polar bear get together, it results in a growler bear, or pizzly bear, or grizzlar, whichever you like the most. You can see them even in the wild. These two types of bears have a mutual contempt for one another. Yep, they're not good at living together in a mutual habitat. But even though it's rare, the love can still happen and result in these cute caramel-colored hybrid growler bears. In most cases, they'll be a bit smaller than polar bears, on average 60 inches tall at the shoulder, and approximate weight 1,000 pounds. But they're well equipped for surviving in warmer climates, thanks to the genes they got from their grizzly family side. Now let's get to one pretty tough fella, the jag lion. As its name implies, it's the hybrid of a jaguar and a lion. We don't know much about these intriguing big cats because only a few of them exist. 
but there was an unintentional mixing between a black jaguar and a lioness, which eventually resulted in two jag lion cubs. One had a dark gray coat with black spots because of the dominant melanin gene black jaguars usually have. The other one had a lion color and the rosette pattern spots that remind you of a jaguar. Yep, you already know it. There are also liguars, a hybrid of a female jaguar and a male lion. That's some colorful family. Speaking of wild cats, have you ever heard of a savanna cat? Savanna cats are in both categories of house pets and exotic hybrids, since they're a mix of a domestic cat and a wild African serval hybrid animal. We're talking about striking animals, almost as big as a domestic cat. But what gives them their exotic look are their tall bodies, slender forms, and spotted coats. These cats are extremely loyal, intelligent, and loving creatures. Here's one unexpected mixture, a zebroid. Technically, it's a name people use to describe a hybrid of a zebra and any equine species. But when you pair a zebra and a horse, their young is called a zorse. Zebra hybrids mostly look like whichever animals they've been crossbred with, but with the striped coat of a pure zebra. Most of these hybrid creatures don't even have fully striped coats. You can mostly see the stripes on non-white areas of their bodies and legs. Speaking of zebra hybrids, check out this adorable creature. It's called a zonkey, or zedonk, zebras, zanki, eh, take your pick. They're mostly either tan, gray, or brown in color. You'll distinguish them by unique stripes that are darkest on their legs and belly. Unlike some hybrids, such as the liger, zonkeys can normally live in the wild. In fact, that's where you can find them, living life to the fullest across savannas and open woodland, mostly in Africa. Can you guess what a geep is? <laughs> yep, a combination of goat and sheep, and definitely one of the most adorable and cuddliest hybrid creatures in this video. Geeps are very rare. Some experts even believe it's possible that they're not true hybrids, but just sheep with certain genetic abnormalities. After all, sheep and goats do carry different numbers of chromosomes, which means cross-species mixes are almost impossible. When a camel and a llama get together, you get a cute little thing called a comma. Similar to beefalo, the comma also produces the best economic traits of both its parents. The first one was born in 1998. Commas don't have camel humps. Their body is covered in soft, fleecy fur, similar to their llama side of the family. They can drink big amounts of water at a time, so they can survive with almost no water at all for pretty long periods. The koi wolf is a hybrid where nothing looks that unusual to most people, since the coyote and the wolf are not that drastically different in their looks. After all, these two species only diverged around 200,000 years ago. Now they're still able to mate and bring koi wolf cubs to the world. People living in eastern Canada and the US might be familiar with these smart adaptable animals that inhabit their forests, neighborhood parks, or sometimes even cities. These hybrids have emerged over the past century or so. And they've picked up the characteristics of both their parents. When a koi wolf is fully grown, it's somewhere in between the size of both parents. But it's also 55 pounds heavier than pure coyotes, and has a bigger jaw, longer legs, smaller ears, and a bushier tail. Check out the narluga, an extremely rare creature whose parents are a narwhal and a beluga whale. It's a pretty strange animal, but far from being lonely, they mostly live in the North Atlantic. Scientists had suspected their existence for decades. In 1990, they found an unusual looking whale skull located in an Inuit hunter's tool shed in Greenland. People from that area said that there were other similar looking animals, and they fit the description of neither a beluga whale nor a narwhal. People said they had gray skin, narwhal-like tails, and beluga-like flippers. Narwhals and beluga whales are similar in size, and they share a family, the Monodontidae family. So it may not even be that surprising that they're able to successfully breed in the wild. Fail. Oh, what a waste of an hour running around with a rolled up newspaper trying to get that fly that keeps buzzing around your head. Well, three things. Why isn't it afraid of you? And why won't it just fly away? And how is it so incredibly fast? Flies actually have a pretty normal speed for their size. 
you're just a bit too slow. A tiny fly brain reacts several times faster than yours to what it sees. One second to the fly feels like five or six to you. When a fly looks at you, it sees you as if you're hanging out at the bottom of your local pool, moving around really slowly. What if you dropped a balloon from your bedroom window and watched it fall to the ground? That's how slow a fly sees regular things fall. So it has ninja reaction speeds, but it also has special eyes. They're divided into thousands of receptors that capture light all at the same time. You use small muscles to turn your eyes and head around to look in different directions. Flies don't have these muscles. They don't need them. They can see in every direction at the same time, almost. No matter what side you attack from, that fly's almost definitely gonna see it coming. You've probably seen supersonic planes in the movies, turning and flipping around at warp speed. A fly's kinda like that, but with way cooler wings. It can change directions mid-flight, stop, and dodge any obstacles. It can even calculate a flight strategy before it takes off. Well, this time you're really gonna swat that fly. As you raise your rolled up paper, the insect's brain calculates where it's gonna land. The fly immediately puts its body in the perfect position, ready to perform an evasive maneuver. If your hand moves in front of the insect, its legs immediately tilt backwards to help it fly off in the other direction. Wow, that fly would make a great boxer or soccer goalie. So why does that fly even bother sticking around? You're always trying to squish it. Well, because your body is a five-star feast and your skin is the buffet table with row upon row of tasty treats. Mm. As you move about your day, your skin releases sweat, proteins, carbs, salt, sugar, and all other chemicals that flies are crazy about. Imagine you're hungry and thirsty, walking through a desert. You come over a tall sand dune and see it. Free food! Tables of fruit, candy, sandwiches, and the world's biggest soda fountain. The bouncer looks big, tough, round. It's a giant slow turtle. Now you know why the fly sticks around. You're the turtle. You actually do have a chance to get that fly. But it's still going to get away 8 times out of 10. Say a fly sitting on your kitchen table. Here's what you do. You need to aim a few inches in front of where you think it's going to fly to. The fly brain will think you're aiming right at it, so you can actually outwit the fly and take it by surprise. The problem? It's really hard to predict the fly's escape route. So you're too slow. How about calling in some backup? Meet the tiger beetle. Speed, 8 feet per second. It can't fly, but that doesn't matter. This beetle runs so fast, it loses the ability to see while it's moving. It aims itself at a target and then runs. It's not a ninja like the fly, and it can't change directions mid-sprint. It has to stop before each run. You walk it around 4.5 feet per second, so the beetle goes like twice your speed. But for its size, it's incredibly fast. It runs 125 lengths of its body in one second. Now, say you're 6 feet tall. You have to run 750 feet in one second. As long as it's on the same surface as that pesky fly, the fly doesn't stand a chance. Or maybe it's time to call in air support. The dragonfly is the fastest flying insect in the world. This little creature can reach 35 miles per hour. That's faster than you riding your bike down a steep hill. The dragonfly's wings also allow it to fly back, right, left, up and down, just like a helicopter. Doesn't matter how fast the fly moves, it's pretty much game over. Flies, dragonflies, and tiger beetles are fast because they don't want to spend a lot of extra time out in the open. There are a lot of hungry creatures around. But there's one insect that runs fast because if it stopped, ouch! To meet a speedy silver ant, you need to go to the Sahara Desert. The sand here is so hot, you could fry an egg on it. Mmm, sandy. That's why the silver ant speeds at around 2.5 feet per second. It doesn't want to burn its feet. It also has triangle-shaped hair that reflects heat, helping the ant escape the scorching sun. If that ant were human-sized, it could run at 400 miles per hour, faster than the fastest car in the world. There's another ant that holds a speed record. The Dracula ant can't run as fast as the silver ant, but it has the fastest mouth in the world, 
um, other than me, it can open and close its jaws 5,000 times, all in the blink of an eye. Literally. How about another fast one, this time a bit closer to home, or in it? The American cockroach can hide in the walls, behind the stove, pretty much anywhere. It's almost impossible to catch. It can run 5 feet per second. That's because of its six legs. Each one has three knees. Its legs are covered with small hairs that sense any change in the air. That's why it reacts so fast when you walk into the kitchen and turn the light on. And the world record for fastest creature on land is the size of a sesame seed. It's a type of mite, and it can move at 322 body lengths per second. If you zap the mite to turn it to human size, it could go almost two times faster than the speed of sound. The mite can even change direction while moving. That makes it the fastest, most elusive creature on the planet. But let's find some animals that actually make us feel good about ourselves. The garden snail. It belongs to the mollusk family, and it likes to take its sweet time. If you were moving at snail speed, you'd take two steps every two hours. But snails don't care. They've been around for hundreds of millions of years. Snails use their shell for protection, but they have other tricks too. Some snails give off a nasty smell so that no one bothers them. (laughs) If it gets too hot and dry, snails hide in their shells and seal themselves in using that cool slime they make. That slime also helps them climb up trees. Sloths are the slowest mammals on the planet. Thanks to their slow metabolism, food can take up to 16 days to get digested. Wouldn't be that hard to catch up to one of them. But their slowness actually helps them. You know how in the movies they say, stop, don't make any sudden movements? Well, a sloth has that part down cold. Other animals simply don't notice them up there among the leaves. Manatees are one of the slowest sea creatures. But they're not too worried about anyone messing with them, except for humans in motorboats. They are huge, and they have thick, thick skin. It's like a sea tank, but way cuter. Another slow swimmer is the Greenland shark. It swims at less than one mile per hour. Like the manatee, it's large and in charge. No one's likely to challenge it face to face. But this all leads to the most hilarious snacking technique ever. The Greenland shark is basically slower than every single fish in the water. The only chance it has is to wait for some of those fish to fall asleep. Then it's snack time. The cool thing is that their easygoing lifestyle actually prolongs their life. The average lifespan of a Greenland shark is 300 to 500 years. They live in the North Atlantic and Arctic oceans. Imagine you're on a cruise and you see one of these slow-motion giants. It might be 400 years older than you. Squirrels' teeth never stop growing. But the animals wear them down by gnawing on nuts and other hard foods. The front of the rodent's teeth is actually orange. It's because they're covered in special tough enamel. Bet you're glad you don't have that to deal with. Some bird species don't mind munching on chili peppers. That's because they can't feel the heat. Peppers burn your mouth because they contain a special chemical, capsaicin. But birds don't have the taste buds needed to feel its effects. The rhino's horn is made of hair, or at least the same protein that makes up your hair and nails. This protein is called keratin. Such a horn is kind of unique since other animals have horns with a bony center. The woodpecker can peck the wood 20 times per second. This pace is almost too high for the human eye to notice. How much wood would a woodpecker peck if a woodpecker could peck wood? The number of pecks often reaches a total of 8,000 to 12,000 a day. A starfish does have eyes, one on the end of each of its arms. These eyes are light-sensitive groups of cells. Frogs don't need to drink water. Instead, they have an area known as the drinking patch. It's on their bellies and thighs. They use it to absorb water directly through the skin. Well, that could save some time. Most caterpillar species have around 4,000 muscles in their body, and almost 250 of them are in the head alone. Christmas tree worms are much more beautiful than you can imagine. But even though the pines look awesome, two-thirds of the worm's body is hidden in a calcium carbonite tube. And the point of this is… 
Now, I don't have one. Narwhals' famous tusks are actually their teeth that are kind of turned inside out. These unicorns of the sea have just two teeth. And in males, one of them grows right through their upper lip. Unlike your teeth, this one is tough inside and sensitive and soft on the outside. The anteater doesn't have teeth, but it's not a problem. This creature has a super long tongue. This tongue helps the animal lap up more than 35,000 termites and ants every day. Now well, that's one way to lick hunger. The flea can jump more than 200 times their body length. If humans had such an ability, they would jump as high as the Empire State Building. Woohoo! The red eyed tree frog's eggs can hatch earlier if they sense their environment isn't safe. Small animals with fast metabolism see in slow mo. This helps them escape larger creatures. Koalas' fingerprints are very, very similar to the human ones. Sometimes these animals' fingerprints even get confused at crime scenes, probably in Australia. The hippo's sweat is pink and not exactly sweat. It's a reddish, oily fluid. Its function is to not cool the body, but to moisturize the skin and protect it. This fluid also functions as an antibiotic. So, you get sunburn or cut, you can smear a hippo all over you. Polar bear skin is black, and the hairs of their coat are hollow and almost see-through. These animals have fur growing even on the bottom of their paws. This gives them a better grip on ice and protects against cold. Some species of tarantulas, some of the largest spiders in the world, can live without food for more than two years. I still think they're creepy. Platypuses close their eyes while kissing. Uh, I mean, swimming. They have special folds of skin covering their ears and eyes. They prevent water from getting inside. These animals' nostrils also have a watertight seal. Emus can't walk backwards, but scientists aren't sure why. These flightless birds are the only ones that have calf muscles. Emus can sprint really fast. They can also travel long distances, but they can't back up. Crocodiles can't move their tongue because it's attached to the mouth roof. It keeps the throat closed and protects the animal's airway. Water snakes, dolphins, whales, alligators, crocodiles, and turtles can drown. It'll happen if they stay underwater for too long. These animals can't breathe in the water. They can just hold their breath for a very long time. Only one species of birds can fly backwards. That's hummingbirds. Hey, go talk to the emu. These tiny birds can also beat their wings up to 80 times per second. Despite what elephant shrews look like, these small animals are more closely related to elephants than shrews. Maybe that's why they have their trademark trunk-like noses. Elephant shrews use them to munch on insects. True enough. Cats, as well as other felines, can't taste sweet things. They don't have the taste buds needed for that. Too bad, more for me. Flamingos can only eat with their heads upside down. That's why their lower bill is massive and their upper bill isn't fixed. Such an arrangement is perfect for upside-down feeding. But it's the opposite of what other birds have. It's not easy being pink. Tiger skin is as striped as their fur. That's all I have to say about that. When toucans sleep, they curl into pretty tight balls. These birds can turn their head so that their tail covers their head and the beak rests on the back. So yeah, they have a ball. The ostrich has some of the largest eyes in the animal kingdom. They're more massive than a bird's brain. Each eye is as big as a billiard ball. All clownfish get born male, but in some circumstances, they can turn into females. This change is irreversible. Unlike most fish, when seahorses mate, they do it for life. Even cuter, when the mates travel, they move side by side and often hold on to each other's tails. The male usually gets stuck schlepping the luggage. Termites never sleep. They don't need to recharge their batteries. But they can eat 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, on your house. The sloth needs up to 2 weeks to digest its food. Hey, take your time, no hurry, nothing on the schedule. Dogs' nose prints can be used for their identification. They are similar to human fingerprints and unique for each animal. 
Owls don't have eyeballs. Instead, they have eye tubes that don't move in the eye sockets. Penguins don't have external ears, but their hearing is especially sharp. Especially when they're on the lookout for polar bears. Shh, let's not tell them. Jellyfish are up to 98% water. That's why when they get washed ashore, their bodies can evaporate into the air after just a few hours. If a traffic jam happens underwater, an alligator will always give way to a manatee. Nice manners. Grizzly bears have such a strong bite that they can crush a bowling ball. So it's smart just to let them win. Giant pandas aren't picky about their sleeping spots. They usually fall asleep wherever they are, in most cases right on the forest floor. The giant panda's newborn cubs are tiny. They weigh like a small cup of coffee and are smaller than a mouse. The red handfish can walk along the ocean floor with the help of its hands. But of course, they are not hands, but evolved fins, really. Cats don't usually meow at each other. A study has shown the felines use this way of communication mostly to get attention from us humans. And it works. Sloths can't shiver. It's not that they're too busy digesting that two-week-old meal. Their fur is sometimes covered with algae. And when they get too hot or too cold, their metabolism shuts down. During the hard times, immortal jellyfish transform themselves back into their younger state. Once they reach the stage when they're nothing but a blob of tissue, like me, these creatures start to grow again. And this process can apparently repeat again and again. The closest living relatives of the T-Rex are chickens and ostriches. Don't turn your back. The moray eel has another set of jaws that can extend from his throat. First, the main jaws close around an unlucky sea creature. Then the additional set grabs the eel's future meal with backward-pointing razor-sharp teeth. And after that, the captured animal gets dragged back into the eel's throat. I just lost my appetite. Some species of snails have hairy shells. Thanks to these hairs, snails can better stick to wet surfaces. When humpback whales hunt, they often gather in a group and apply a bubble net tactic to catch their food. The bubbles don't let the schools of fish get away. Snow leopards can't roar like other large felines. It has to do with their less developed vocal cords. But these animals can meow growl, hiss, and even purr. Not to drift away from their group while napping, sea otters hold hands. They can also entangle themselves in giant seaweed for the same purpose. Hey, it kelps. Lions are often called the king of the prairie. I thought it was the king of the jungle. And still, up to 90% of all the hunting in the pride is done by the females. The males are in charge of protecting the territory and the pride members. And they make the delicious potato salad known as Hakuna Matator. Cats are famous for their uncanny ability to move their ears. All because kitties have 32 muscles in each outer ear. Some shark species can glow in the dark. Unfortunately, only other sharks can see this greenish glimmer. You have up to 8,000 taste buds. But your pooch has just a bit over 1,500. The blue jay can imitate other birds. Its favorite is a hawk's call. The blue jay uses it to scare away other birds from its territory. Slow lorries are insanely cute and just as treacherous. They're the only known (laughs) venomous primates. They have a gland in the crook of their inner arm. It secretes toxins that can cause unpleasant consequences in people. The heart of beast has an amazing evasion tactic. To run away from other animals, they move in a zigzag pattern. Bottlenose dolphins have names for one another. Those are specific whistles. Hey, Bob. Hey, Charlie. Hey, Dolly. Hey, boys. And thanks for all the fish. Giraffes have long, and I mean it, black tongues. Scientists suppose this color might protect the tongue from getting sunburned. Well, that's all I got. See ya. Despite their cold-blooded nature, crocodiles and alligators are some of the most caring and gentle parents in the animal world. Come on, really? Yeah? 
females of these frightening animals lay from 10 to 60 eggs at a time and then bury their eggs in riverside nests. They build the nests out of plants they break off with their teeth and push together using back legs. Then croc moms patiently wait up to three months, protecting their future babies from any danger. Although crocodiles themselves are very strong and frightening animals, they don't hesitate to hire special babysitters to protect their nests, the water thick knees. It might seem like a risky deal, but these birds have formed a win-win alliance with crocs. They place their eggs nearby and, together, they scare away big reptiles like Nile monitors and other predators. Crocodiles have an excellent sense of hearing. Bird cries alert the mother about all uninvited guests, and the mama croc goes out of the water to protect her babies and bird nests along the way. When baby crocodiles are born, they're of a size of a large banana, and it takes years for them to reach maturity, from 4 to 15 years, depending on the species. In some cases, a female crocodile helps her babies to hatch by putting the eggs in her mouth and rolling them. Then she what? Spits out a kid? Apparently so. Baby crocs tend to stay together close to their mommy during the first one to three years of life. The mother assists her children in digging out of the nest and carries them to the water in her mouth. A female crocodile can place up to 15 babies in her mouth at once, and instincts prevent her from closing her jaws. So newly hatched babies feel safe in the crocodile's mouth as if it were a cradle with teeth. Although the croc teaches her babies to hunt and provides protection from predators, only about 1% of the hatchlings survive to adulthood due to predators and weather conditions. Sad news for any parent, but crocs are cold-blooded reptiles after all. The only reason they cry is physiological rather than emotional. When crocs spend enough time out of the water, their eyes get so dry that they cry to keep them lubricated. If a baby crocodile manages to survive its childhood, it gets the chance to live a very long life. Just like some other reptiles, turtles, and whales, crocodiles exhibit the so-called negligible senescence, or in simple words, a lack of normal aging. It means they don't actually get older, just bigger and badder. They're only afraid of getting sick or being attacked by other predators. Although the average lifespan of crocodiles varies from 50 to 70 years, some of them reach over 100 years. So in theory, someone may meet a 500-year-old crocodile as huge as an airplane somewhere deep in the tropics. But the chances to survive and tell the tale of this meeting are slim, because the crocodile's appetite grows in proportion to its body. Mr. Freshy, who passed away at the age of 140 years, was the oldest documented crocodile that was in captivity. It was caught in the Moorhead River in 1970 and resided at the Australian Zoo. Mr. Freshy was called after its kind, freshwater crocodile, the breed that has never been witnessed doing any harm to humans. At the age of 10, when crocodiles reach the body length of about 5 to 10 feet, they become mature enough to give birth to their own babies. The mating dance involves several steps. Males produce a special low-frequency sound which humans can't perceive. But for crocodile females, it sounds like an invitation to become a mother and continue the gentle parenting tradition. Hey, could we call this the crocodile rock? Hey, I like that song. Of course, crocodiles are not the only animals that demonstrate surprisingly high family values and dedication. Polar bears, for example, are very attentive and take time to teach their cubs all necessary survival skills in the cold climate. While the babies are still in their mother's belly, polar bears construct a special space by digging into deep snowdrifts. This space serves as a home for the future cubs. They spend their first months of their life getting milk and heat from their mother. Polar bears usually give birth in a period between November and January and don't allow the cubs to get out until spring. The newborn's fur is very fine, and they're not yet ready to face severe colds. Once the cubs emerge from the den, the mother bear begins to teach them how to survive in the outside world. Babies mimic her every move, learning how to swim, hunt, build dens, and migrate. Mother will fight off predators and larger polar bears and hide her cubs from any threat. After two to three years together, babies learn everything they need to know and leave her. But they'll still be able to recognize their mother throughout their life, which lasts up to 30 years. Another example of caring motherhood can be found among our close relatives, primates. 
Gorillas, chimpanzees, and bonobos, a cousin of the chimp, embrace and kiss their newborns just like humans. While feeding their little ones, primate females release special hormones associated with motherhood feelings and gentleness. When it comes to breastfeeding, orangutans are the champions. This process may continue for up to 8 years. In the wild, orangutan mothers nurse their offspring for up to 7 years, which is longer than any other primate. During this period, mothers teach their infants to find food and build sleeping nests on their own. The bond between female orangutans and their mothers is stronger than that of males. Daughters may continue living with mothers until they reach the childbearing age that equals 15 or 16 years. Yeah, they just won't move out. Just like humans, apes may have mother issues that impact their social life. Maternal support helps young primates to gain dominance and mating success when they grow up. On the other hand, apes who didn't get enough nurturing in their childhood tend to have fewer children when they reach maturity. Meanwhile, males of African elephants don't fight for dominance because all important issues are resolved by females. And every calf in the herd is cared for by everyone equally. A young elephant mother gets the assistance of her sisters and older aunts while giving birth and raising her child. That's why elephants are considered some of the most protective moms on the planet. Herds of female elephants and children tend to travel together in a special circle. They put the youngest members of the group inside the circle to protect them from predators. Also, older elephants will adjust the pace of the herd so the calves don't get tired and lag behind. Females in the social group will communicate with babies using affectionate gestures and teach them how to find food. And everyone packs their own trunk. <laughs> By the way, girl elephants are very attached to their mothers and will typically remain together until the mother passes away from old age. And the average lifespan of elephants is around 65 years or even more. Mothers bear the cubs for two years of that time, so no surprise they're so attached to each other. Giraffe females also have a long pregnancy period, 15 months. But it makes sense because the giraffe calf is already on its feet very soon after birth. Mother nurses giraffe babies for about 9 to 12 months. When she needs to go find some food, she will hide her babies or ask other giraffes to look after them. Like humans, giraffe moms need to stay awake. They can afford to sleep from 30 minutes to a couple of hours a day. And even that in extremely short periods, like 5 to 10 minutes at a time. The remaining time is dedicated to guarding and protecting her babies. Emperor penguin mothers are not afraid of difficulties either. After laying an egg, the female leaves it with a male who protects it from any threat. Meanwhile, the mother takes a long journey of up to 50 miles to reach the ocean shore and catch some fish. When the fishing is over, she returns to the hatch site to feed the fish to her newly hatched babies. Mmm, seafood! Using the warmth of her own body, the penguin female keeps the younger generation safe and warm. So Megalodon was one of the biggest and most ferocious monsters on our planet. Powerful jaws, razor-sharp teeth, gigantic size. But what do you know about how it sounded? Imagine how loudly it growled, permeating the underwater world with sound vibrations. This sound resembled eh, nothing. Megalodon didn't have a voice. It was a shark, and sharks don't have sound-producing organs. It was a quiet danger. But despite its muteness, yes, that is a word, you could have still heard it. Come with me. Now you're underwater, clenching your fist, raising your hand, and quickly bringing it down. Now imagine that you have a big submarine instead of a fist, and hear the water flowing around the smooth surface of the hull. That's what a megalodon sounded like. When this monster was swimming out to the surface and opening its jaws, it sounded like a waterfall. The giant shark swam at high speed. When the water was passing through its mouth and gills, it sounded like a flowing river, a fast, powerful river. Megalodon had no voice, only the scary sound of flowing water. Other ancient fish could make sounds, but you would hardly hear them. Whales, dolphins, and their distant ancestors are not counted because they're mammals. Fish communicated at frequencies elusive to human ears. They still have this ability, but in most, the ocean was and is a pretty quiet place. So let's get out on ancient lands and check what was going on with the sounds there. Thanks to modern technologies, scientists can analyze the sounds of many ancient animals. 
Using CT scans, they found that some dinosaurs had complex systems of small open pockets in their skulls. They used these winding cranial mazes to reproduce a wide range of sounds and regulate body temperature. And people have managed to hear them. An ancient bird that lived 79 to 140 million years ago, Vegasus, sounded similar to some farm birds like duck and geese. But the ancient creature probably screamed in a scarier way. Scientists found this out thanks to the Shrinks fossil they discovered in 2016 in Antarctica. It's the oldest known vocal organ in the world. It helped Vegasus make a double humming sound coming from the left and right sides of the Shrinx. Imagine a duck and goose screaming. Increase the volume several times. Perhaps that's what its distant ancestors sound like. As for other flying reptiles like the pterodactyl, it couldn't scream like Vegasus because it didn't have a syrinx. These winged monsters could growl, hiss, and snap their beaks, and this was their most effective sound. Remember any tall basketball player? The skull of the pterodactyl was slightly longer than their height. Just imagine what a noise the dinosaur created when it was snapping its powerful beak. The clicking sound could deafen and frighten other ancient creatures nearby. Now, you probably know what a Tyrannosaurus sounds like, thanks to the movies. Among thousands of others, you'll recognize this prolonged roar similar to a chainsaw, vacuum cleaner, and horn. And, honestly, its roar has a lot in common with the natural sounds that this monster could make. Thanks to modern technologies and well-preserved remains, scientists managed to simulate the voice of these ancient animals. Imagine you're uploading data about a T-Rex into a program and preparing to hear an intimidating roar. You press play, and it sounds like a bee. Tyrannosaurus rex's scream was similar to birds, not mammals. But it wasn't just a bee. It used nostrils to scream, not a mouth. The hum came from the chest and resembled a siren with low bass. Maybe it sounded a lot more intimidating than what we saw in the movies. It was louder than all the trumpets of the symphony orchestra, and it did it only with the help of its nose. It's not known for sure whether it could growl through the mouth. You could also hear how long-necked dinosaurs sounded in the movies. Their calls were similar to those of elephants, something between a saxophone and a car horn. But in fact, these tall creatures whispered. Almost all mammals make sounds thanks to the laryngeal nerve. This nerve runs down along the neck, then goes around the blood vessels of the chest and comes back to the larynx. In short, the brain gives a signal and it passes twice the distance along the body before the sound is released from the mouth. And now, remember those long necks of dinosaurs? This was the height of a five-story building. But the voice signal had to run a distance of 10 floors. It took too long to make this long trip, and this affected the dinosaur's roar. So when they wanted to make a sound, they just hissed. And it was probably similar to the sound of a giant viper. But the most detailed sounds scientists have managed to get belongs to the Parasaur olefus. You know this herbivorous dinosaur thanks to the long crest on the back of its head. We saw the dinosaur using it in movies and documentaries to fight opponents and enemies. Some scientists believed it also used the comb to drop fruits and leaves from trees. Others thought the dinosaur used it to improve its sense of smell. But it turned out that in addition to self-defense and fighting, they used the comb to make loud and scary sounds in different keys. Scientists replicated this with fantastic accuracy thanks to the structure of its hard tissues. Almost all living beings with a voice use soft organs to make sounds. And these soft tissues decompose quickly. Parasar olefus had solid ones. They noticed tubes leading from the nostrils to the crest and back to the nostrils when they found the skull. It was like a crumhorn, a curved musical wind instrument. This proved the dinosaur used the crest on the back of its head to make the sounds louder. The comb allowed it to trumpet so its relatives could hear it in the forest. They made humming sounds with low and high notes. Mix a saxophone and trumpet with a goose hum, car horns, and low frequencies, then increase the volume several times. That's what Parasar Olefus sounded like. That's also what my fourth grade band sounded like. But I digress. You can listen to different shades and timbers of this dinosaur on the internet. It used noises with different tones to create complex social connections. 
They could communicate, identify each other, trumpet danger, or conversely, signal their friendly intentions. Alright, we've just heard how some ancient reptiles sounded. But what about ancient insects? They didn't have vocal cords, of course. Instead, they used friction between body parts. Look at modern crickets chirping with their wings. One wing has tiny notches. The second has the shape of a mediator. Take a simple plastic comb and run your fingertip over its teeth. Crickets make their sounds by the same principle. Their wings vibrate and release a series of sound waves into the air. But the clicking of an ancient bush cricket was very different from modern insects since they were much noisier. The sounds of these clicks were like a whistle. With the help of high-frequency waves, they could also communicate secretly as if they were doing it through a closed radio channel. If you heard this, you would hardly be able to fall asleep to it. Now, modern crickets are not so loud, as they began to add more high frequencies to their sounds. Higher pitch waves don't spread as far, reducing the risk that a bat will hear the insects. Just imagine how the jungle of that time sounded. The loud chirping of crickets hurts the ears. Then you hear a brachiosaurus hissing. The clicks of pterodactyls shake the sky like thunderclaps. Then you hear the trumpet sounds of different tones somewhere in the jungle. These are Parasaurolophus communicating with each other. And then you get scared by a loud Tyrannosaurus siren. What a racket! You'd probably not find peace in such conditions. Fortunately, humans appeared millions of years later. And by the way, scientists have managed to find out and understand what our distant ancestors sounded like. They carefully examined the insert function of the mouth, nose, and throat on the Neanderthal skeleton. Their voices were similar to ours, but the phonetic range of an adult Neanderthal was the same as if they were two to three years old. It was like mumbling without consonant sounds. The study of the skull couldn't recreate precisely the sound of Neanderthals. But in 2007, scientists extracted DNA samples from their bones. They found a variation of the gene that responds to human speech. Scientists believe that Neanderthals fought with Homo sapiens. You know, our family tree. As a result of this conflict, their kind became extinct. But the found gene points they could have had other connections with each other. Perhaps Neanderthals could understand their language and even pronounce some words. Lions, dogs, cats, all these mammals sleep in pretty comfortable positions. But not whales. They look like giant floating loaves of bread, which is a scene one diver accidentally came across in the Caribbean Sea. Six whales were just standing upright with their tails pointed down at a depth of about 65 feet below the surface. Scientists discovered that when sperm whales take a nap, they stay in this position for 10 to 15 minutes. They don't move or breathe. But these creatures spend only 7% of their time asleep, far less than other mammals. Usually, they either rest peacefully in the water or relax, slowly swimming next to other marine animals. When they're moving and sleeping at the same time, they're actually taking a nap. These animals can't go too deep and need to stay close to the surface. Great white sharks sleep and hunt at greater depths, which means one less thing to worry about when taking a quick nap. Plus, it gets pretty cold the deeper you go. And whales need warmer environments that can help them maintain the temperature of their large bodies. When alone, dolphins enter a stage of deep sleep. It usually happens at night and lasts for only a few hours at a time. While sleeping, the animal floats at the surface. It shuts down half of its brain, I can relate, together with the opposite eye. The other half is at a low alert level, awake and ready to react if some unwanted visitor comes closer. The part of the brain that is awake also sends signals when it's time to go up to the surface to take a breath of fresh air. Marine mammals have the blowhole. That's a flap of skin they can open and close whenever they want. People breathe automatically. Your body knows what it needs to do even when you're sleeping. But whales and dolphins have a voluntary breathing system. It means they need to consciously go to the surface to get some air. And one part of their brain needs to always be awake to inform the animal it's time to go up. Whales and dolphins can hold their breath way longer than other species. They also have a higher tolerance for carbon dioxide and can take in more air. Their red blood cells store more oxygen, too. 
Whales' and dolphins' blood goes only to those body parts that really need oxygen. If a whale only uses its brain, heart, fins, and some other muscles needed for swimming at the moment, those will also be the only body parts that will get the oxygen. Digestion or other functions can wait. The ocean is not a place where you can relax and peacefully fall asleep. While sleeping, fish reduce their activity. Their metabolism becomes slow. Some of them keep floating in the same spot. Others find a safer place among corals or in the mud. Early in life, dolphins learn to make a unique whistle that helps others from their pod to identify them. That means these specific whistles are their names, and dolphins do respond to them. Clams have feet. It looks like a large tongue that sometimes protrudes from the shell, but that's actually the foot. And it's relatively long compared to the length of the animal. Clams use this limb to dig themselves in the sand. The blue whale is the largest living animal, and it's also larger than the majority of dinosaurs used to be. They can grow to more than 100 feet long and have a weight of almost 200 tons. That's like 50 adult elephants. A blue whale's tongue alone can weigh more than one elephant. Such a giant surely needs to eat a lot, half a million calories in just one mouthful. The blue whale's heart is the size of a small car and weighs 1,300 pounds. To move the blood through such a giant body, the heartbeats are so strong, you can hear them even from 2 miles away. The heart of a whale beats only 8 to 10 times per minute. The whale is one of the loudest creatures out there. Its call can go up to 180 decibels, which is as loud as a jet plane. Almost 95% of jellyfish's body is made of water. For comparison, the human body is 60% water. It's probably not a surprise since jellyfish don't have a heart, blood, eyes, or brain. The other 5% of their body weight is proteins, muscles, and nerve cells. Jellyfish have been around for more than 500 million years. This makes them older than dinosaurs. These creatures haven't changed much, and today's jellyfish are pretty much like their ancestors. These creatures live in the ocean, but in 1991, more than 2,000 jellyfish polyps were taken into space. Scientists wanted to see how they would react in the environment with no gravity. The jellyfish reproduced and created 60,000 new polyps. But unfortunately, those couldn't function normally after getting back to Earth. One species of jellyfish can literally live forever. As it grows older, the critter goes down to the seafloor to become a polyp again. And that polyp turns into a new jellyfish with the same genetics. Greenland sharks can live 500 years. This is an animal with almost the longest lifespan among vertebrates. Sperm whales are sociable creatures. They spend their life surrounded by their family. These animals support one another and have close friends they remember well, even if they don't see each other for a long time. Electric eels have small eyes that are not so effective in environments with no light, so they mostly rely on their electric organs. Those consist of 6,000 cells. Eels use them to stow power, similar to batteries. These creatures use electricity like bats use their radars or dolphins their sonar. An eel can also produce enough electricity to power a panel of light bulbs. There's a small tropical archer fish that can learn to recognize human faces. This fish has an interesting ability to spit small jets of water from its mouth. Researchers showed the fish the image of two different faces placed side by side. One was unknown and the other was familiar. The fish was supposed to spit water at the familiar one. The creature took the right guess more than 80% of the time. Every year in the winter, great white sharks that live along the California coastline disappear. It feels as if they take a vacation for 30 to 40 days. The animals go to a point halfway between Hawaii and Mexico. They might do it to get some food, relax, or hang out with their buddies from other areas. The spot is now called the Whale Shark Cafe. Some types of sharks, like makos, whale sharks, or white sharks, breathe in a very specific way. It requires them to swim all the time. They also need to move quickly and with their mouth open. This way, the oxygen can enter and reach their gills. Sea sponges are some of the most primitive animals. They're immobile, don't have a mouth, eyes, bones, brain, heart, lungs, or any other organ whatsoever. And still, they're alive. 
There's such a thing as a sea unicorn. That's an animal called the narwhal. Its horn is actually a tooth that can grow up to 10 feet long. Manatees, also known as sea cows, are distant relatives of elephants. Their weight can go up to 1,000 pounds. These creatures are vegetarian and need to eat around 10% of their total weight on a daily basis. That's lots of sea salad. In some cases, manatees share space with alligators, but they get along pretty well. You can even find a photo from Florida where an alligator rides a manatee's back. Frogfish have special fins that help these creatures walk along the sand. They're very useful in shallow waters. A ghost pipefish is hard to see, but once you spot it, you're bound to get really surprised. Its head makes up over 40% of its body. Crabs don't feel like wasting time on such formalities as putting foods in their mouth. That's why they taste it with their feet, which is where their taste buds are. Marine iguanas are the only lizards on our planet that like spending time in the ocean, even though they mainly live on land. They're herbivores that feed in shallow waters and swim like snakes. Iguanas use their long claws to hold on to the bottom when they need to graze. Green turtles can cross over 1,400 miles when migrating. They try to find the perfect spot to lay their eggs. Penguins sort of fly when they're underwater, reaching a speed of 25 miles per hour. More than 5 million years ago, I've heard, I wasn't around then, deep sea worms and humans had a common ancestor. So we still share 70% of our genes with these creatures, and with sea stars, squid, and octopuses. The ocean covers over 70% of our planet, and over 80% of it is unexplored. More than 1 million species live there. But there are not only animals. 3 million shipwrecks are lying all over the ocean floor, hiding mysterious stories. Many of them are yet to be discovered. Now, sloths can hold their breath longer than dolphins. Yep, incredible but true. They slow their heart rate so much, they can stay under the surface for up to 40 minutes. Unlike fish, dolphins and whales are aquatic mammals, which means they can't breathe underwater. When it comes to breathing, they're more similar to us than the fish. Both of them have lungs, and they breathe air through something we know as a blowhole. When they're under the surface, they hold their breath until they come up for some air again. Dolphins can stay under the water for 10 minutes. A sperm whale can hold its breath for 90 minutes, while an elephant seal holds the record when it comes to aquatic mammals and can stay under the water for 2 hours without having to go up. There's a wasp so tiny, much tinier than its name, it's smaller than an amoeba, even though amoebas are made of one cell only. You can see this wasp has the same body parts as the rest of the bugs – wings, brain, eyes, and the rest – but it's really a tiny version of an insect, since it's only eight thousandths of an inch long. And the smallest adult insect we know of is a parasitic wasp with a big name, also known as the fairy fly. Their males don't have wings, they're blind and only five thousandths of an inch long. Now, it's no coincidence each animal species has different colors and patterns. One of the reasons for that is to help them stand out when looking for their potential mating partners or to send a warning to predators they're poisonous and hope they get the message right. Then there are ambush predators, such as tigers. It's very important for them to remain invisible because the difference is huge. If their prey sees them before they get there, no dinner that night. But why exactly are tigers orange? For us, orange is a color used for things that need to be ultra-visible. For example, items such as safety vests or traffic cones. To the human eye, orange will mostly stand out in the environment. So if there's a tiger coming for you, you'll spot it relatively easily. But humans have so-called trichromatic color vision. When light from your surroundings enters your eye, it hits the retina, a thin layer located in the back. To process that light, the retina uses two kinds of light receptors, rods and cones. Rods can only distinguish differences in light and darkness. They can't sense color. Our eyes will mostly rely on rods in dim light. Cones are in charge of color perception. Humans mostly have three types. Cones for green, blue, and red. That's exactly why we call our vision trichromatic. 
most humans see three primary colors together with their colorful combinations. Apes and some monkeys also have such a style of vision. But most mammals that live on land, including cats, horses, deer, and dogs, have dichromatic color vision. Retinas in their eyes have cones for two colors only, green and blue. When humans get information from their green and blue cones only, they're considered colorblind since they can't, for example, tell the difference between green and red shades. This is similar with mammals that live on land. Deer are surely tigers' prey way more than humans, and deer don't see tigers as orange, but green. Green tigers would surely be more difficult to spot, which would mean more dinner for tigers. But evolution still decided to go with orange because it's simply easier to produce such a color. The only green mammal is a sloth, but its fur is not naturally green. It's because of the algae that grows in it, and they can hold their breath for 40 minutes. The water around the poles can get very cold during certain periods of the year. There's plenty of fish that live there, but when that happens, they need to swim away to survive. But there's a special group of fish native to the southern ocean near Antarctica. The temperatures there are from 28 to 39 degrees Fahrenheit. Technically, that's below freezing, but all those dissolved salts in the seawater don't allow it to freeze over. And these fish can survive because they have a special feature called glycoprotein. It helps them stay in their home because it acts as sort of a natural antifreeze. It's a protein that prevents all those ice crystals from forming in their blood and helps it continue to flow normally. Have you ever wondered how tiny animals like ants breathe? Try to open your mouth and throat, but at the same time, hold your chest and diaphragm still. The diaphragm is a muscular structure that separates the chest and abdominal cavities in all mammals. It expands as you breathe. If you can't do this, you can't hold your breath, because oxygen will still find its way into your lungs. At least, enough of it to keep up with your body's demands. But generally, when you breathe, diaphragm is actively pumping air in and out of your body. To survive without the diaphragm doing so, you'd need more than one throat and a way smaller body. Now, ants have 9 or 10 pairs of openings along the sides of their tiny bodies. They're called spiracles, and each is connected to branching series of tubes. It's a system similar to human lungs. Their blood doesn't carry oxygen from those tubes to the rest of the body. Instead, the tubes spread this oxygen. The endings of these branches directly touch the membranes of their cells. This can only work in really small animals. When the body is bigger than 8 tenths of an inch, these tubes are too long, so they can't diffuse air fast enough. There are a couple of reasons why giraffes have long necks, which, by the way, can grow up to be 6.5 feet long. From first glance, it seems evolution gave them those to reach the sweetest topmost leaves of the trees. It's exclusive access other animals can only dream of, so giraffes don't have to compete for the best bites. But over time, researchers realized it's not the only reason. They also think the neck could be a good factor when male giraffes go into combat, the same as male antelopes will use their prongs or when a stag uses its antlers. The thicker the neck, the bigger the chances to win the combat. Some insects play possum when there's a predator nearby. For instance, in one research, scientists have observed an antlion larva insect. It played possum for 61 minutes. How does this even help? Well, let's say you're in a garden where you see a bunch of identical bushes with soft fruit. You go to the first bush and start collecting and eating fruits. Mmm, yummy! It's so simple! And you're doing it relatively fast. But as you strip that bush, it's getting harder for you to find more fruits. Plus, it's kind of irritating because it takes way more time now than at the beginning. So now you need to decide whether to stay there and try to find more, or simply switch to another bush to have it all easy and fast once again. Assuming you are the predator, and predators are greedy, you'll just look for ways to eat as much fruit as possible in the shortest period of time. This means you'll go on and start collecting fruits from another bush, and the next one, and so on. Researchers use the same logic when it comes to bird and antlion larvae. It appears that insects waste the predator's time when playing possum, 
which has a significant impact on how things go later. That way, they encourage the predator to look for food elsewhere, because the predator doesn't have that much time to waste. So, pretending to be not alive is actually a good way to stay alive. Depending on the species, young birds spend from 10 to 30 days in their eggs. There's no air inside, but Mother Nature created a perfect mechanism for them to still be able to breathe. As a young chick is developing inside the egg, it grows some kind of hollow sac-like structure from the gut. It's like a tiny pouch that fuses with a second membrane that goes around the chick and its yolk. So one end is attached to the chick, while the other is close to the inner surface of the eggshell. That way, this special membrane acts like lung tissue and connects the outside world with the chick's circulatory system. Most animals have two eyes, but some species need more. For example, some reptiles, amphibians, and fish have a third eye on top of the head. It's not something that improves their vision that much, but it simply helps them navigate via the sunlight and regulate their body temperature. Many invertebrates have more than two eyes. Most spiders have eight of them, because that way they can spot their prey easier. Lions, elephants, and bears! Oh my! Three of the most beautiful yet intimidating members of the animal kingdom. But what intimidates these creatures, if anything? You might be surprised. Let's take a look. How about we start with the universally recognized king of the jungle, the lion. We'll get to the elephants in a moment, but there's actually one in the room. You know, the one that claims that a certain jungle cat is afraid of the most vital substance known to man? A small hint, it covers 70% of Earth's surface. So, is it true? Is the ferocious lion afraid of water? It's actually a myth. Lions enjoy taking a dip in the water because it allows them to cool off. This makes sense if you think about the climates the creatures have to face. Temperatures in a savanna climate range from 68 to 86 degrees Fahrenheit. You know all of us humans hit the beach whenever the weather is like that. So why should we expect anything different from the lion? Especially given that the creatures typically carry around between 280 and 420 pounds of weight, as well as a thick coat of fur. The ironic thing about this whole lions are afraid of water myth is that they're actually fantastic swimmers. The same goes for all of your other favorite large cats from these warm weather climates, such as tigers, leopards, jaguars, and ocelots. It's actually large cats from cold climates that do their best to avoid water. This applies to such felines as bobcats, lynxes, and snow leopards. The latter lives in places like the cold alpine tundra biome. That's a rocky mountainous area. Temperatures there, on average, get as low as 33 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, it makes perfect sense that these big, cold weather cats despise water. Getting their fur coats wet would dampen their chances of staying warm, pun intended. I don't think you have to look too far to piece together where this lions are afraid of water myth comes from. In fact, there's a good chance for some of you watching this video that the reason is near your computer screen right now, jumping around and causing mischief. That's right, we may have jumped ourselves to a conclusion that certain behavioral aspects of our own pet cats would match that of a lion. House cats, though related to all the previously mentioned big cats, are not actually directly descended from them. They instead have developed over millions of years from a single wild ancestor that still exists in the wild today, the Near Eastern Wildcat. As water is not plentiful in the Middle East, these cats were not exposed to it to any great degree. Like their descendants, they only appreciate it as a food source. As you likely see with your pet, they hardly bathe, swim, or interact with water in general. Lucky for them, they don't even need to. These domestic felines use their tongues to clean themselves. They can do this because their tongues have tiny hook-shaped papillae. They assist cats in grooming out knots and keeping the coat clean, sweet-smelling, and in overall mm. immaculate shape. Cats, in general, are individualistic creatures. And you may be screaming at your screen right now proclaiming that your cat, in fact, loves water. And this is definitely possible. Some cats even like to play with water. For example, drips from the tap or bubbles in the bath. 
There are specific breeds of house cats that are known to enjoy the aqua life more than others. The Turkish Van, for example, which is also appropriately known as the swimming cat. It's believed that the breed developed an affinity for water by swimming in Lake Van to cool down. This lake is in the area the animals evolved from. Moving on to a problem a cat definitely doesn't have to deal with. Have you ever heard of musophobia, also known as surifobia? Both words are valid names for a fear of mice and rats. There is a common belief that one particular animal that has this fear is the beautiful elephant. That's right, the same animal that, depending on the species, stands at the height of roughly 10 feet and weighs about 9,000 pounds. It's supposedly afraid of a creature that is a mere 4 inches in length and weighs less than 1 pound. But why did this belief appear? Well, the reasoning for this rumor is based on the possibility that elephants are paranoid about mice climbing inside their trunks. If a mouse succeeded in doing this, there would be a potential that it could cause irritation and blockage within the trunk. Now, I'm not trying to be the guy who spoils parties, but it looks like this belief is also a myth. Researchers claim that there's no concrete evidence that suggests elephants are afraid of mice. The most they'll concede is that the giant animal may sometimes take fright by the sudden appearance of the tiny rodent, which is the exact same for ourselves. Experts also claim that even if a mouse did get inside an elephant's trunk, the latter could effortlessly blow it back out with a puff of air. There's also some evidence that, in most cases, the animal remains unbothered by rodents and even allows mice to climb on their heads and trunks. Researchers are sure that as long as an elephant is healthy, there's no other animal that it fears simply because of its size. So, lions aren't afraid of water, elephants don't seem to be afraid of mice, then are any of these animal fear rumors real? Hmm. We're probably going to be left just as disappointed by asking if a bear has any legit fear, right? Well, ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause for none other than people's best friend. That's right, bears do feel quite uncomfortable whenever they are around dogs. And all this despite a very distant genetic link to them. When the two creatures encounter each other, the dog has the ability to chase, intimidate, corner, or antagonize the bear. As for the powerful animal, it will instead try to avoid any run-ins with the dog. There's even a type of Finnish dog breed known as the Karelian bear dog. This dog species is specifically used for standing up to large animals, such as bears. This dog has a great sense of direction, body flexibility, and control, courage, sense of smell, and persistence. So, does this mean you can walk with your dog through an area known to have bears and feel absolutely calm and confident because of the presence of your loyal companion? Not really. Despite the fact that bears may be nervous around dogs, we can't forget their size and power. The American black bear can reach a height of nearly 7 feet and weigh up to 660 pounds. If a mother bear has nowhere to run or feels that her cubs might be in danger, it's extremely possible that she will lash out, which can only mean big trouble for you or your dog. So, nobody should ever test this theory. Instead, if you're ever planning to visit an unknown area with your dog, you should first plan ahead and familiarize yourself with the wildlife you may encounter there. Because you never know what a bear will do when it notices you and your pooch, especially given their mild case of cynophobia, which is the name given to a fear of dogs. At least we were able to find one genuine fear of another animal out of these three tough members of the animal kingdom. Weird that a dog, something that gives so many of us such joy and comfort in our own homes, is still the creature that's brave enough to take on a bear if need be. Well, not all heroes wear capes. Some just wear fur and a dog collar. Why don't we take a look at what frightens these great companions of ours? Ever wondered why your own dog becomes uncomfortable when it hears loud noises? The degree of fear differs in each dog. But it's the simple unpredictability of thunder and flashing lightning, or loud bangs that accompany firework displays, that causes your dog uneasiness. The inability to understand what's causing this deafening noise may cause your dog to tremble, tuck its tail between its legs, or even run away from home. Another thing that can really frighten our loyal pets 
is when we leave them all alone by themselves. This can, unfortunately, lead to being a nightmare for your next door neighbors because a common symptom of this fear is excessive barking. This fear may also cause problems closer to home. Ever asked yourself why your dog chewed up your sofa? Housebreaking accidents are typical when a dog has separation anxiety. You can't stay mad at your dog for long though, right? Your pooch will make it up to you when you guys run into a bear. There are sharks that glow in the dark. For example, swell sharks. They live in the dark ocean depths, almost 1,700 feet under the surface. No one knows why exactly, but they emit a fluorescent glow only other swell sharks can see. Scientists detected the glow because they used filters that blocked out yellow light. They think that could be the way for these big fish to communicate with their buddies. This glow helps sharks fight infections on a microbial level. Cowbirds have secret passwords they use to recognize each other. They're a specific type of parasite bird since they lay their eggs in other bird species' nests. The young cowbirds have an inner mechanism where they recognize their species singing, like some sort of secret password only they know. That's how they manage to find others of their kind. A grizzly bear has an incredibly strong bite. It may look cute, but if you're close to this big guy, you better stay out of reach of its sharp claws and especially its mouth. Its bite force is more than 8 million pascals, which means it can crush a bowling ball. Some animals have skin-deep stripes and others have more superficial ones. Tigers are in the first group. Not only is their fur striped, but their skin is as well. It's the same with some other furry big cats, like snow leopards. Giraffes and zebras are in the second group, since they have patterns only on their coats. Speaking of zebras, do you think they're black with white stripes or white with black stripes? At first, it really looks like the second option is correct. Their black stripes mostly end towards the inside of their legs and on their bellies, and the rest of it is white. But that's not true. Surprisingly, they're black with white stripes. All of their fur, both white and black, grows from follicles that have something called melanocyte cells. All animals have these cells. They produce a pigment called melanin, and it gives color to their hair and skin. When it comes to zebras, chemical messengers tell which melanocytes send pigment to which area of fur. That's why zebras have a black and white pattern. But white is not actually its own pigment. It's an absence of melanin. So, black is their default color. Koalas have fingerprints that are so close to ours that they could even taint crime scenes. It doesn't seem like they have a lot in common with humans, but take a closer look at their hands. They have distinctive loops and arches. So if any koalas want to do something illegal, it would be a good idea for them to wear gloves. Ghost crabs growl when they're around creatures they don't like or find threatening. They do it using teeth in their stomachs. First, they'll let you know they'll defend themselves if you try anything by showing you their claws. If that doesn't work, they'll go for fearsome growling noises like dogs. But the noise is coming from rubbing their three elongated hard teeth inside their stomach. Ghost crabs produce the same noise when they're grinding up food. Speaking of teeth, did you know narwhal tusks are actually some sort of an inside-out tooth? Unlike the majority of other whales, narwhals are the ones that come with a large tusk or tooth that grows from the inside of their jaw. It has up to 10 million nerve endings, and they're unprotected, which means its tusk is very sensitive to any type of contact. It's almost like a piece of skin, because tusks usually don't have many nerve endings. Up to 95% of humans are right-handed, and it's the same with bottlenose dolphins. There are even more right-handed ones among them than among humans. During one study, scientists found that bottlenose dolphins turn to their left side over 99% of the time, which means they're right-handed. They place their right side and right eye closer to the ocean floor as they go for prey, such as squids, shrimps, or smaller fish. More cool facts from the ocean. Did you know humpback whales use bubbles when they go after their prey? You might think they don't need any special method considering how large they are, but when they're lurking for prey in the open waters, 
these whales team up and use something called a bubble net technique. While swimming in an upward spiral, they blow bubbles underwater. These bubbles make it difficult for fish to escape. The oldest evidence we have of domesticated cats dates up to 12,000 years ago. Researchers discovered this almost 20 years ago when they were digging through an ancient village in Cyprus. They found cat bones right next to human ones, which suggested they were close even when their lives came to an end. Humans were hunters, so they domesticated dogs first, somewhere up to 29,000 years ago. Dogs helped them catch other animals, but they didn't think they needed cats until they started to settle down and store surplus crops. Mice became frequent guests in grain stores, so cats came in handy in those times. Puffins are quite innovative when they want to scratch their bodies. They can surely be proud of their stunning beaks, but they obviously think it's not enough for scratching. Researchers noticed they tend to spontaneously take a small wooden stick to scratch an itchy spot. There's a special type of ant that only lives in a small part of Manhattan. The Broadway medians at the 63rd and 76th Street is the area these crawling critters decided was the best spot for them. The Manhattan ant looks like it's from Europe, but no European species can actually match it. Hey Potterheads, can you believe there's a thing like chocolate frog? Well, not quite, but it looks like it. New Guinea and Australia weren't always separated. They spent millions of years together until about 12,000 years ago, rising sea levels divided them. Since they were together for so long, some animals and plants still inhabit both areas, including green tree frogs. These frogs have spread really far and wide, and some of them, who live in hot, swampy regions surrounded by plenty of crocodiles, actually look like they're made of chocolate. We all know flamingos for their specific color, but they're not actually pink. They're born gray, and that's how they would stay if it weren't for their diet of blue-green algae and shrimp. These foods have a specific natural dye, which is why flamingo feathers turn pink over time. These little Tasmanian devils grow up and leave their moms. They socialize together, forming bonds that last for the rest of their lives. Not only them, cows also have stronger social ties than we think. They like to socialize, and they make long-lasting friendships. One research even discovered their heart rates significantly increase as a sign of stress when they're separated from their BFFs. Imagine you could simply freeze yourself solid during the cold winter days instead of listening to your teeth chatter and trying to tighten your jacket. That's what frogs can do. Aquatic frogs mostly hibernate underwater and spend most of the winter at the bottom of a pond, lake, or some other body of water. Toads and frogs are generally cold-blooded, which means the temperature of their body takes on the temperature of their surroundings. So, frogs can freeze during the winter because of a high concentration of sugar or glucose in their vital organs. Once they unfreeze, they continue as if nothing happened. Octopuses have three hearts and blue blood. They can move at speeds of 25 miles per hour, and they spray ink that not only blurs the predator's visual field, but actually harms them. Also, they have nine brains, the central one and eight smaller brains located in their arms. That's why their arms can open a shellfish while the central brain is busy doing something else. An octopus even tastes with its arms. They have cells in their suckers that enable the arms to touch and taste in a way that they detect chemicals marine creatures produce. That way, an octopus can distinguish prey from rocks. So, we all know that Mother Nature is wise. If she blesses some creature with a particular body part, it should make perfect sense, right? Well, yeah, but still, some wildlife shots make you wonder if evolution has gone the wrong way. Snakes' natural design allows them to swallow a whole mouse. But in some cases, this cool ability can turn against them. Yes, snakes can actually swallow themselves. Scientists believe that they mostly do this because of stress, captivity, temperature regulation, hunger, or illness. The snake is pretty helpless in this situation, you can tell. If it doesn't get help in time, digestive juices may begin to corrode the swallow tail. So if you ever catch your pet snake doing this, try to stop it or take it to the vet. Okay, but what about the fangs, I hear you ask? 
does a venomous snake have immunity to its own venom? Well, if the snake digests it, it will be okay. It's because protein is a primary component in venom. And besides, the venom is excreted by the gland in the snake's mouth. So no matter whom the snake bites, chances are that it's going to drink a bit. So the only way a snake can actually suffer from its own venom is by biting itself straight into the blood vessel. In this case, it'll experience the same reaction as any other animal. Now, think you're having a bad hair day? Hey, check this guy out. Chris was an Australian merino ram who became a celebrity in 2015 after being discovered in the wild. Farmers shorn him and gained nearly 90 pounds of wool. When the animal was found, he carried over five years' worth of fleece on his body. But Chris belonged to the domestic sheep breed that needs to be shorn regularly. Otherwise, the animal is at great risk of injury and infection. So the lives of these cuties depend directly on going to the hairdresser. Shall we talk about horns? Cattle, goats, and many other species proudly wear this fancy headdress not only for fashion, but also as a weapon for brutal battles. If you ask this bighorn sheep ram directly how old he is, you'll probably hear something like, bah. But if you want to get a more precise answer, you can count the number of rings on his horns. The biggest and the darkest ring usually marks the fourth birthday, when the ram matures enough for mating. Although animal horns may look very tough, in fact, most of them are made of keratin. It's the same protein that builds human hair and nails. Horns never stop growing as the animal ages, just like our own hair. And eventually, they can curl into really extravagant shapes, making these weapons turn against their owners. This is what a Wilshire sheep horn looks like when it's young. But as the years go by, the horns typically curl in front of its face. And while most grow out harmlessly, the inward-growing horns can end up dangerously close to the sheep's head. Like this ram who's having bad luck, to say the least. Its horn has slowly grown into its own skull, and eventually, well, it didn't end well for the sheep. Of course, this would hardly have happened on a farm, because people would have made a preventive horn cut. But unfortunately, in the wild, animals cannot use hairdresser services. That's why they use rocks and branches to rub and grind away at their horns to keep them safe, just like humans trim their nails. Faulty genetics is not the only reason for the horn distortion. You see, when males of the species want to fight for dominance, they begin to butt heads to show each other who's the alpha male here. Mm -hmm. These battles can break horn plates, making them grow at weird and dangerous angles. The fancier the original shape of the horns is, the more problems their fracture may cause. This poor African kudu is a bright example. Fortunately, in some cases, unlimited body part growth can be good for the animal. Just take a look at these adorable smiles. If you happen to break off your own molar tooth, your dentist would probably say it's irreversible and offer a replacement. But if an alpaca breaks its front teeth, all it has to do is wait a bit. Although these animals don't have upper teeth, their lower teeth constantly grow throughout their lifetime. And they might look pretty creepy when they get too long. That's why some farmers prefer trimming them from time to time. Just like pet owners cut the nails of their cats or dogs. Now llamas look so similar to alpacas that many people confuse these two species. But the significant difference between them is that llamas' front teeth are encased in enamel. That's why, unlike alpacas, they don't possess the superpower of limited growth. Eh, too bad. Unlike the keratin horns, deer antlers are made entirely of bone. Typically, only male deers, called stags, grow antlers. Very rarely, females can grow them too due to a serious hormone imbalance. This is a deer equivalent of a beard on a human female that sometimes can appear due to various diseases. Adult deers grow and shed their antlers annually, which coincides with the breeding season. At first, their antlers are covered in velvet, a protective skin with blood vessels. But once the antler is fully developed, the deer gets rid of the velvet, just like snakes shed their skin. Although this process doesn't harm the deer, it may look pretty spooky. Once the brand new antlers are ready, stags begin to fight with other males over the ladies' attention. Usually stags barely eat or sleep during this competition. 
And if you ever question whether the antlers of two deers can get locked together, the answer is yes. Every stag is risking ending up stuck with his own rival instead of having a romantic night out with a female deer. Bummer. Moreover, all the traumas that the deer gets during the mating season can influence further antler growth if specific nerves get damaged. Just like horns, antlers can develop at distorted angles because of genetic failures. Some mutations can even make them grow monstrously large. This unlucky deer can barely move his head without losing balance. Also, if a deer breaks one of its legs, its body can speed up the healing by sacrificing the bone and blood material from one of the antlers. And thus, this antler will get thinner and weaker. And speaking of facial extensions, we cannot skip the tusks. Please meet Babarusa from Indonesia. This ancient boar first emerged over 35,000 years ago. It's easy to confuse these big tusks with horns, but they are actually upper canines. They tend to pierce through the skin of the boar's face as it matures. Scientists believe that these intimidating tusks have evolved as a tool to protect eyes and throat while fighting with other males during mating season. But this design doesn't seem very thoughtful. If a male boar doesn't grind his tusk regularly, they can end up curling back into his own skull, which can blind him or even worse. Now, what if I told you that hoofs can grow out of control just like horns and antlers? It took evolution millions of years to turn the middle toe of the animal's foot bone into the hoof. And just like toenails, they tend to grow and curl into creepy shapes if they aren't cut regularly. When donkeys or horses don't have a chance to wear down their hooves naturally by walking on hard surfaces, they tend to overgrow. This makes the animals walk on the balls of their feet and overstretch the tendons, which may result in pain and bone loss. And eventually, they can lose the ability to walk at all. So if you ever come across a horse with curly hooves, consider calling the experts to give it an emergency manicure. Perhaps one of the most obvious questions regarding the undersea world is, can a fish drown in the water? Yup, it can. Although gills are an amazing gift of nature, there are still many factors that may deprive a fish of healthy breathing. When the oxygen level in the water is too low, fish begin to suffocate. But it happens very rarely in the wild. Oxygen deficit usually appears in aquariums that are not washed and replenished often enough. Also, parasites, diseases, and an overall imbalance in water components can cause the fish to drown. And on that note, I need to hoof it on out of here. See you next time. That award for the smallest heart in the world goes to a fairy fly. It's a little insect that's about as thick as a piece of paper. You'll need a microscope to see its heart. Despite the name, this creature isn't a fly. The fairy fly is actually a wasp. If you ever get a chance to look at one under a microscope, you'll see the resemblance. Moving over to bigger but equally impressive hearts from the animal kingdom. Zebrafish have a very cool ability when it comes to their tickers, which are only about 0.04 inches in diameter. Their hearts can regenerate. If a zebrafish's heart ever gets damaged or has a problem, most of the time it can repair itself. Human hearts may be awesome since they continuously try to replace their cells and repair heart tissue, but it's no match for that of the zebrafish. Let's look at cockroaches. Our hearts have four chambers, each of them with a designated task. The system can't function without all four working properly. The heart of a cockroach has 12 to 13 chambers, which are placed in a row along the length of the insect's body, on average about 1.5 inches. They work separately since they're powered by different muscles. This means that if any of those chambers gets affected, the insect might not even notice. Most of the time, the cockroaches survive without all those heart chambers working properly. A hummingbird's heart can beat up to 1,200 times per minute. The heart of a human athlete might only go as fast as 220 beats per minute. Despite being one of the smallest hearts in the world, that of a hummingbird is quite large compared to the bird's full size. It amounts to about 2.5% of its total body weight. By the way, 
the blue-throated hummingbird flaps its wings up to 15 times each second. It's so fast that this movement cannot be perceived by the human eye. That impressive speed is backed up by an even faster heart, which beats up to 21 times each second. Ever heard of the emperor penguin? It's not a penguin species that just happens to have a crown on its head, if that's what you're thinking. They are fascinating swimmers that can dive deeper than any other bird, up to 700 feet. Not to mention that they can stay submerged for up to 18 minutes at a time as they gather food. Their hearts are equally as spectacular, weighing somewhere around 5 ounces. Their hearts are very slow. When in the water, an emperor penguin can reduce its heart rate to about 15 beats per minute. It shuts down the blood supply to all but the most vital organs. It also dials down oxygen consumption, allowing the animal to use only what's necessary for deep water hunting. Heart size tends to be pretty proportional throughout the animal kingdom. Most of these organs weigh somewhere around 0.6% of an animal's body mass. Dogs and wolves have bigger hearts by comparison about 0.8% of the animal's total weight. An average dog's heart weighs about 20 ounces. If a human heart suddenly got filled with fat, it would become a problem pretty fast. But that's very different for a python, though. If that happens to this reptile, it's actually a sign that things are going great. Pythons tend to have really big meals, after each of such meals, their hearts get larger by about 40%. And since a python can weigh as much as 250 pounds, that's a lot. Most of these increases is caused by the snake's heart swelling up because of fatty acids absorbed from the meal. These reptiles adapted to do so to speed up their digestion, even though it still takes them days to process one single meal. Their blood gets so full of fatty acids, it even changes its color and consistency. In some cases, it may even turn opaque, looking more like milk than anything else. Finishing our chart on the other side of the spectrum, the largest heart in the animal kingdom belongs to the blue whale. And for a good reason, since they're some of the largest animals ever. This giant heart is about as big as a bathtub and weighs more than the average gorilla. Regardless of their size, animal hearts are amazing. Us humans and most animals just have one heart, but this rule doesn't apply to all creatures. Take octopuses or squids, which have three hearts. This is how their system works. Two of their hearts help to pump blood to the gills, so they have enough oxygen in their bodies. The third heart pumps blood around the body. Some animals don't have hearts altogether. It doesn't necessarily make them mean, though. Jellyfish, starfish, or corals lead pretty good lives even without hearts. Take starfish, for example. They don't even have blood. That's probably the reason why they don't need a heart either. No list is complete without some amazing facts about the human heart. You don't need to Google it or look for an anatomy book to know how big your heart is. Just squeeze your fingers and make a fist. That's about as large as the heart gets in adults. This amazing organ is responsible for keeping everything active in our bodies. It can beat about 115,000 times every day. Ever watched a cartoon in which the main character's heart just starts pumping out of its chest? Most of the time, we're tricked into thinking that the sound our heart makes is produced when this organ touches the tissue surrounding it when beating. Turns out that this sound is actually made by the opening and closing of the heart valves. They're like small doors inside our hearts that ensure that blood flows correctly from one side of the heart to the other. For our bodies to work, blood needs to move at the right time and in the right direction. Our lungs are not twins, they're siblings, and our heart is the reason. Our right lung is bigger and tends to weigh more, and our heart is to blame. 
our ticker tilts to the left a bit. This creates a small indentation in our left lung, which is called the cardiac impression. The right lung may be bigger, but it's a bit shorter since it needs to make room for the liver. Speaking of positioning, our heart is really not as far on the left as we might think. It's actually pretty centered with just a slight tilt to the left. People born with dextrocardia, though, have their hearts positioned on the right side of their chest. This condition, on its own, isn't problematic, but it tends to coincide with other diseases that can have serious effects on the heart and other organs. Do you know most heart attacks happen on Mondays? The reason is still up for debate, but most scientists believe it has to do with the stress of starting a new working week or with the changes in our sleep-wake cycle. You tend to sleep more at the weekend, and waking up earlier on Monday may be detrimental to your heart. Your heart started beating about four weeks after you were conceived, and it won't stop until you pass away. Sure, it may get weaker as you grow older, but the heart doesn't get tired. It's a really hard job if you think about it. Try this experiment to test it out. Squeeze a tennis ball in your hand. Your beating heart is about the same force, 100,000 times a day. I bet you'll lose count before finishing. In some cases, the energy our hearts need to carry on pumping is unstable. That's why pacemakers were invented. They act like small generators placed inside the human body. They help with stabilizing abnormal heart rhythms. The first ever device of this kind was put into a woman's body back in 1958. Her name was Arna Larson, and when she passed away at 86, it was because of other issues. It had nothing to do with her heart. The sky suddenly turns orange. All you can see as you look up are millions of butterflies. You just got lucky to witness the spectacular natural show, the annual migration of monarch butterflies. Every fall, as the days get shorter and the temperatures go down in the northeastern US and Canada, these beautiful creatures leave their summer breeding grounds. They travel up to 3,000 miles to Mexico and never come back. Their perfect overwintering ground is high in the mountains. Millions of monarch butterflies are safe there in the canopy of OML fir trees. Once the winter is over, it's time for them to go back up north. They make a stopover around Texas to mate and lay eggs on milkweed plants. A few days later, these eggs turn into caterpillars that feed on the plant until they transform into grown-up butterflies. Now, it's their turn to continue the journey up north until they find a new breeding ground. This way, generations keep changing en route, and it may take up to five of them to get to the final destination back in Canada. It's a natural mystery how the butterflies traveling south live up to eight months traveling with the air currents. The same species going back completes its life cycle in five to seven weeks. Scientists still don't know why the monarchs migrate and how they find their way. It could be connected with the blooming of milkweed plants, their primary food source. They probably find their way around based on the position of the sun. Humpback whales are real champions when it comes to migration and size among mammals. They cover a distance of up to 5,000 miles following their lunch. In the summer, they move towards the poles to colder waters, where there's plenty of krill and small fish. In the winter, they go south towards the equator's tropical waters. They also travel to mate. They have specific locations where they gather to do it. During the winter breeding season, you can hear male humpback whales sing, most likely to attract females or mark their territory. They produce a long series of calls and can repeat the same song for several hours. When the song changes, all singers that are currently migrating pick up the new tune. It's amazing how they do it when the distance between groups can be over 3,000 miles. Sea turtles migrate for more sentimental reasons. 
for hundreds of millions of years, these cute family guys return to the exact place where they were born to lay their eggs. They can cover up to thousands of miles, mostly when the seasons change and the waters are of a comfortable temperature. It could take them years, since some of them travel across the Pacific Ocean between Indonesia and the west coast of the United States and Canada, which is a total of 10,000 miles. But how do they find the exact spot they need if their parents can't just send them a geotag? Scientists have found out that they navigate using the invisible lines of the Earth's magnetic field. It turns out that each part of the coastline has its unique magnetic characteristics. The turtles remember theirs and travel using their internal compass. The magnetic field changes slowly but surely, so they have to shift their nesting sites accordingly. Salmon are born in freshwater streams and move to the ocean as juveniles. Atlantic salmon are brown and spotted as they cover hundreds of miles in fresh water and turn silvery in the ocean, where they travel for up to a thousand miles. Adult salmon stay in the ocean for one to five years, feeding mostly on zooplankton. Then it's time for them to go back to freshwater to spawn. On their way back to the breeding grounds, they have to ascend thousands of feet against the current in mountain streams. This challenging journey is called a salmon run. They set on this run because they know the stream they're headed to will be good for spawning and they'll meet the right species to mate with. Young salmon remember the smell of their home stream and probably even take note of various points along the way to the ocean to find it again. Just like sea turtles, they use the Earth's magnetic field as a compass for their travels. Pacific salmon and most male Atlantic salmon only live for a few weeks after spawning and some female Atlantic salmon survive and migrate back to the ocean. Caribou, better known as reindeer, are the champs when it comes to migration distance among land mammals. Every spring, they cover a distance of around 400 miles in Alaska, from their winter to their summer feeding grounds. Individuals cover up to 3,000 miles, but herd migration is way more spectacular. The largest herd has at least 260,000 members, and its migration territory covers an area larger than California. Scientists put radio tracker collars on some herd members and take thousands of photos to count them all. This census is organized every three years in good weather conditions to see if the population figures are rising or falling and track their migration patterns. Caribou grow through all this migration trouble to safely raise their newborn young. They reach remote grounds where golden eagles, wolves, and grizzly bears won't bother the youngsters during their first, most vulnerable days. Another good excuse to hit the road up north for them is to save themselves from mosquitoes, which would be a huge problem in warmer months. Plus, they get fresh seasonal foods from the areas they stay in. Their migration helps fertilize the grounds they pass by which means the tundra should thank them for regenerating and protecting its grasslands. Wildebeest, also known as news, are relatives of antelopes and gazelles. They spend most of their lives in the Serengeti plains of southeastern Africa, grazing on the grassy savannas. Every year at the end of the rainy season, normally in May or June, millions of wildebeest head northwest in search of greener pastures and then back again. This migration is so spectacular that it's considered one of the seven wonders of the natural world. Sadly, not all wildebeest make it to their final destination, as they have to cross rivers full of giant crocodiles and pass by hungry lions and other predators. If you look at dragonflies' migration routes, you can call them real globetrotters. Scientists discovered one such route that spanned from India to the Maldives, Seychelles, Mozambique, Uganda, and back again for at least 8,700 miles. It's the longest insect migration we know of so far. It looks like they set on this epic journey when the temperature reaches a certain mark and the days start to grow longer. They seem to be following the rains as they start during the monsoon season in India and arrive for the rainy season in eastern and southern Africa. One fragile insect cannot complete the whole trip, 
so it turns into a sort of relay race that includes four generations of dragonflies. Each generation plays its role in the journey. Scientists can't put radio trackers on dragonflies as they do with other animals because the insects are too small. So, to put together the migration route puzzle, they analyze 21 years of data from volunteer citizen scientists and also wing samples from museums. Each of the samples had a chemical code that could roughly tell where the insect was from. This data helped the scientists understand how far this or that insect traveled as an adult. Elephants are known to have traveled across Africa for centuries. They rely on their herd leader's memory when it comes to recalling the tricky migratory routes. This big elephant boss leads everyone else to sources of ripe food and water when the seasons change. They also migrate to avoid danger, which is mostly represented by humans. Elephants have developed their own communication methods to pass on information about prospective danger. They use chemical secretions, vibrations, gestures, and touch. Recently, many African countries have restored some of the oldest elephant migration routes. These big-eared guys usually avoid dangerous areas for generations, but once they know the route is safe, they start using it again. Okay, let's face it, we humans are pretty ordinary. I mean, we're no superheroes with superpowers, right? What, you didn't get the memo? But the animal world has a bunch of superheroes. Some creatures live forever, and those who seem to not care about the laws of gravity. Critters that are immune to venom, and those that can run on water. And some of them will send shivers down your spine. So the first superpower on the list is the ability to live without water. Kangaroo rats can get by without water for years. They actually don't mind living without any water. Humans, on the other hand, can only survive three days without water. Human zero, kangaroo rats one. These little buddies live in extremely arid desert areas and have to get water from the seeds and plants they eat. And although it may sound a bit disturbing, kangaroo rats also know how to extract water from their urine before they set off on a bathroom trip. This way, they don't waste a single drop of precious moisture. Well, that would come in handy at sporting events. Now let me introduce you to the Peter Parker of the animal world. Yep, seems like Spider-Man is real, hmm. but not human. Meet a gecko lizard, or simply gecko. This critter has a marvelous ability to climb up all kinds of vertical surfaces and can even go for a walk on the ceiling. This gravity-defying feat is possible thanks to the lizard's unique foot pads covered with tiny hairs. They can cling to almost any kind of surface, no matter whether it's smooth, hard, rough, or soft. One more fun fact about these guys is that they lack eyelids, so they always keep an eye wide open for what's going on around them. If you wonder how they keep their eyes protected, here's the answer. Their eyes are covered with a transparent membrane, the cornea. Sure thing, they can't close their eyes, and if they have something in their eye, they simply lick it off. Right, they clean their eyeballs by licking them. I guess that's another superpower. Any supersonic superpowers here? Sure. A one-inch long subtropical shrimp disorients its prey with a sonic boom. Despite its modest size, the pistol shrimp is one of the loudest marine animals. When the shrimp snaps its claws, it creates a sound as loud as a sonic boom. Naturally, this sound stuns the prey, and the shrimp can catch it without too much effort. Now, in the comic world, there's hmm. venom. In the animal world, there's a guy that can be called anti-venom. Opossums are known for their handy trick of pretending to have passed away when a predator attacks them. But that's not the end of the story. These guys are also immune to rattlesnake and pit viper venom. The secret is a peptide that helps opossums neutralize dangerous chemicals. This is the reason why snakes are a favorite treat on opossum's diet. There's one curious thing they have on their diet – ticks. One opossum can hoover up about 5,000 ticks per season, and most of them are picked off their own bodies. Now, imagine a fish that is so notorious that it's called a dangerous fish. It's Mabenga, and it literally translates to dangerous fish in Swahili. This monster lives in freshwater and doesn't mind having a crocodile for lunch. Not a whole crocodile, but Mabenga can take a bite out of them. 
But to be honest, these guys are intimidated by the crocodiles, the same way the crocs are intimidated by them. Now, you're watching this video on some gadget, right? Well, we all owe the gadgets we have to the electric eels in some way. I mean, all gadgets have batteries, and eels contributed a lot to the invention of an electric battery back in 1800. I know, I know, the batteries have unrecognizably changed since then, but still, the first electric battery ever was invented thanks to electric eels. Anyway, if you see one of them and want to thank them for their magnificent invention, don't do that. Thing is, they can deliver shocks up to 860 volts. You don't want to experience that. Now, let's talk about the Count Dracula of the animal kingdom. Nope, I'm not talking about bats. I'm talking about the fanged vampire fish. These fish are known as payara and have two long fangs protruding from their lower jaw. Here's why some people associate them with vampires. Hippos are the beauty gurus, since they know how to save a fortune on skincare. Living under the harsh African sun, these animals secrete a sweat-like red oily substance that evaporates and keeps the animal's bodies cool. Besides, the fluid works as a moisturizer, sunscreen, and antibiotic all in one. But they're not the only ones with such a superpower. Mantis shrimp know how to produce natural sunscreen too, but they use it for eye protection. It's all about amino acid pigments, and these pigments act as special filters that contribute to their sharp vision too. That's what I call multitasking. Meerkats have dark patches around their eyes which make them look even cuter. But these black circles aren't there just to make these buddies more adorable. They also function as built-in sunglasses. The dark fur on the patches blocks the blazing sun, and as a result, meerkats can gaze directly at the sky. On top of that, the sentry, a meerkat that watches out for birds and other predators, can easily see danger coming and alert its mates. Wild goats are famous for their climbing skills, but the alpine ibex from northern Italy is the champion. This critter can climb nearly any vertical surface, defying several physical laws in the process. Interestingly, the animals that do walk on the steepest cliff walls are typically mother goats with their little ones. Large males prefer to keep their distance and use flat horizontal surfaces. Eh, <laughs> smart guys. Some animals protect themselves with venom or nasty bites, while others use chemical tricks for protection. Listen to this. Some species of millipedes produce hydrogen cyanide and exude it when they feel threatened. Hydrogen cyanide is odorless but highly toxic. One little millipede can't seriously hurt you, but you may have burns or even blisters if your skin is sensitive. Plus, to make the picture even scarier, some millipedes glow in the dark. So watch out, and if you see a crawling spot of light at night, run away as fast as you can. When the bombardier beetle feels threatened, it sprays scorching liquid from the tip of its abdomen with a loud popping sound. As soon as the beetle senses danger, a chemical reaction starts in special reservoirs in its abdomen. The heat from this process nearly reaches the boiling point and also produces special gas that triggers the ejection. This super protection is usually fatal for the attacking insects. <laughs> I guess so. Plumed basculus lizards have an uncanny ability to run on water. First of all, their hind feet are equipped with long toes which have fringes of skin that can spread out in the water. As a result, a bigger surface of the lizard's foot comes into contact with water. Then, when it runs on water, it pumps its legs incredibly fast. This creates little pockets of air that prevent the animal from drowning by keeping it on the surface. Now, fleas can be annoying, but it doesn't make them any less amazing. These tiny critters can leap about 50 times their body length. If people could do the same, we would be jumping about a quarter of a mile into the air. Well, let's try it! <laughs> the most curious thing about fleas' astonishing ability is that they take most of the power for leaps from their toes, not knees. So, what's your favorite animal superpower? I vote for the kangaroo rat. I don't like standing in lines for the bathroom. Mm -mm. It's just a regular day. As usual, you're taking a shower before starting to get ready for work. Everything is going as planned. 
Until it isn't. One clumsy move, some water spilled on the floor, and you're flapping your arms in the air, your body nearing the floor with frightening speed. Everything goes black. First thing you hear is a high-pitched whining in your head. Ouch, your head. Ugh. You carefully get up. There's no blood, and that's good. An even better thing is that the annoying noise stops abruptly. Holding your head, you leave the bathroom and almost stumble over your cat, Milo. He hisses, and then a clear voice in your head says, Clumsy loser. Huh? You whip your head around in fear, but you see no one. It's just you and Milo? You've probably hit your head more than you thought. You shrug and make your way to the kitchen. Milo follows you. You hear ceaseless grumbling. Why can he sleep in the bedroom and I'm banned from there? Why haven't I gotten my meal yet? This leather creature's too lazy. Shall I scratch the sofa or leave a mouse on his pillow? The first thought that comes to your mind is, we have mice in the house? The second is more relevant. I'm losing my marbles. Great. Acting on autopilot, you pour some milk into Milo's bowl and fill another one up with some dry food. The cat doesn't seem to be satisfied with how fast you are. If his, oh for goodness sake, move it, man, is anything to go by. Okay, now you'll have to live with the knowledge that your beloved cat Milo actually has the personality of a grumpy old man. Duh. You decide to lock yourself in the bathroom again because you're starting to get overwhelmed. You sit down heavily on the toilet lid and almost jump a foot in the air when you hear someone arguing loudly. After looking around, you find out that, apparently, there are not only mice, but also cockroaches in your house. Just great. At the moment, you're staring at a couple of these insects, which seem to be having a fight. At least, one of them is accusing the other of... Wait, what? Cheating? You've heard enough. You're about to dash out of the bathroom when you hear a bang. In the living room, you find your cat on the floor under a smashed flower pot. The worst thing? He seems to be really hurt. He won't stop whimpering and meowing. Ugh, it hurts! It hurts! My paw! Ouch! Ouch! But the sofa can't remain unscratched today. You grab Milo, shove him into the carrier. Hey, watch out, you leather bag! And head for the clinic. On the way, you have to concentrate hard to block out the noise of countless voices assaulting you. The waiting area at the vet is full. Uh-oh, you're in for a long wait. Half an hour later, your head is ready to explode. You found out that that yellow python is suspiciously interested in the hamster a girl in the corner is clutching to her chest. So fat, so pretty. The hamster's worried about his stash of nuts. Where did I hide them? Where, where, where? A tiny dog that has come with an elderly lady is anxious about needles. Ah, if that shop thingy comes near me once again, they'll regret it. I'll destroy everyone on my way. Finally, it's your turn. The vet invites you to her office, and you bend to pick up Milo when a desperate-looking young man bursts into the room. My puppy! What's wrong with him? The vet looks at you apologetically, but you're focused on the puppy. It looks weak, but you manage to figure out the words, Chocolate! Yum! When you tell the vet and the anxious owner that the pooch has eaten some chocolate, which is basically poison for dogs, they give you a funny look and disappear into the doctor's office. Sometime later, the guy exits, holding the dog that looks way better than before. When they leave, the vet turns to you. How did you figure out the dog had eaten chocolate? Uh-oh, here it comes. You decide that honesty is the best strategy and tell the vet that you can understand what animals say. Of course, she doesn't believe you. You have to try hard to persuade her. But with the help of two other dogs, Milo and an elderly squirrel, you manage to make her believe you. When you get back home, your head is spinning and you're pretty hungry. All you can think about is some fried eggs and bacon. Yum. Wait, bacon? But it's, uh oh, 
Apparently, starting today, you're a vegan. Anyway, that's when it starts. You don't know how it happens, but you become famous overnight. The next morning, a loud noise wakes you up, and it doesn't sound like animals talking to you. You look out of the window and see crowds of people gathered around your house. Some of them are reporters, but others are pet owners that have come to ask you for help. Milo is not happy. While grumbling nonstop and calling you names, he bites your leg and retreats under the stairs. And you go out of your house to talk to people and answer the reporter's questions. In the evening, you're exhausted but also happy. You've saved several animals today. They had serious health and psychological problems their owners couldn't figure out on their own. Lying in bed in the dark, you think of how you can use your ability. That's when your plan takes shape. Soon, you become the most renowned animal care specialist in the world. You listen to animals talking about their problems, talk them out of depression, and help them resolve misunderstandings with their owners. TV shows invite you for interviews. Your YouTube channel is growing every day. People recognize you on the street and ask you to take pictures with them. You travel the world, help endangered species, and give lectures. You open vet clinics all over the globe and invite the best professionals to work there. You never feel lonely. There's always someone to talk to or listen to. At least, some birds when you're walking in the park, or some fish when you're having a rare moment of rest on the beach. At the same time, you've come to realize how many animals are begging for help, but no one can hear them. You decide to take up the role of their speaker. It turns out you're now famous not only in the human world, but also in the world of animals. They're grateful, and in return, they start informing you of different natural disasters that are about to happen on the planet. You've heard that animals can predict earthquakes or volcanic eruptions. And if before, people had to try hard to notice some unusual behavior of certain species, now animals just pass you information about what's going to happen and where. With time, you notice that you spend less time among people and more time with animals. Together, you plan campaigns against zoos, circuses, and other places where animals are kept against their will. And then, one day, the unthinkable happens. You're returning home when a black van stops next to you. A few big masked guys grab you and push you inside. The doors close behind your back. Inside, you find out that several influential people aren't happy with your activity you realize that this trip isn't going to end well. The guys blindfold you and lead you somewhere, but at one moment, you lose your footing and hit your head on something hard. You open your eyes. Milo is standing over you, looking at your lying body rather indifferently. And then the most terrible thing happens. He meows what sounds like a whole sentence, turns away and walks out of the bathroom. And you don't understand a meow of what he's saying. Was it all just a dream? That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos.